quite excited to uh, be talking from my house to people from all over the world about a site 5,000 years old on Cyprus. It's uh, very postmodern, I would say. Um, and of course, uh, as you get it already from the wonderful introduction by Victor, there are many stories we could tell about uh, Palulis. Um, but uh, tonight I'll just focus on one of them, which is about uh, the nature of metallurgy in the Copper Age. Uh, the Copper Age uh, has, uh, the, it has been branded the Copper Age a long time ago, but uh, as you will see in this talk, there's actually very little copper in the Copper Age on the island of Copper, which is uh, Cyprus. And I will present some uh, recent results that we, we just published. And uh, that is the, these results are changing our understanding of um, the nature of metallurgy in the calculating of Cyprus. So this has just come out in uh, the journal Antiquity, which is of course one of the key journals in uh, archeology. span So we're very happy to have that published. Okay, so let's uh, take you first to the general context. This is a picture similar to what uh, Victor was showing you earlier on. So in the third millennium BC from about 2600, things are really starting to change uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, we see the rise of civilization in brackets all across the region, especially of course, in places like Egypt and Mesopotamia, we see the emergence of states and uh, exemplified for example, by the, the pyramids at Giza built around 2600. And uh, in upper Mesopotamia, we have sites like Ebla, uh, where we have a huge palace with uh, thousands of uh, palace workers and enormous uh, archives of tablets telling us about a very sophisticated economic system and uh, you know, a hierarchical state society. And even in uh, Anatolia, at this stage, we have some very remarkable evidence here uh, uh, exemplified by the picture of uh, uh, Troy and uh, the, the wife of uh, Sliman, Sophie Sliman, being adorned with all kinds of jewelry found at the site. And of course, um, the question we are wondering about is uh, what's happening on Cyprus in the same period? And is Cyprus simply bypassed by all these developments around it? Or is it in some way connected to the outside world? Um, so before we actually go to Cyprus, I want to uh, say a little bit more about uh, Troy because it has such a rich data set dealing with uh, metallurgy. So here you see uh, some of the uh, metal objects that have been found in the famous boards from uh, Troy II. So again, the picture of Sophie Sliman, but also here the Hort uh, A from Troy. And there's a series of these types of hoards that have been uncovered. And uh, we're looking at uh, artifacts that have been made with extreme uh, craftsmanship, really very impressive. Um, a long uh, tradition of, of uh, craftsmanship must have existed with the uh, highly specialized people. And they were using materials that were also, um, well, very valuable, often deriving from a very long distance, things like tin, uh, which might actually have come from Turkey. There's a discussion about that. Um, but uh, also uh, things that are less disputed, such as lapis lazuli coming from Afghanistan. We have uh, amber coming from the Baltic. So there's all kinds of material traveling across the map, uh, across the globe. And in some ways we are uh, justified in calling this the first period of uh, globalization. And yet in the middle of this, there is supposedly an island uh, that is uh, not really participating in any of that uh, civilization and long distance trade. And uh, so that's a uh, topic I would like to uh, look at with you today. And um, this is the, the sort of the characterization that archeologists typically make of uh, Calculatic Cyprus. So this is from Cyprian Broodbank. And he writes uh, in his uh, recent uh, synthesis of Eastern Mediterranean 
a few dozen kilometers from a Levant, well on its way to the rise of urban literate palace-based states. We have an archaic tradition of roundhouses and people were still uh, hunting pig, sheep and goat, and fallow deer. Um, and they had this very weird material culture, including the idiosyncratic style of cruciform figurines in uh, picrolite. And so they are kind of very weird, uh, isolated, um, peculiar people, kind of like uh, what we see in Asterix and Obelix, uh, very much in their own uh, tradition and resisting civilization, which is all around them. And of course, um, in some ways, this uh, picture can be painted with some uh, justification. And uh, Victor has already shown you some of these uh, arguments of how Cyprus is actually different. And so we have these roundhouses. Um, this is building one again that you see on the, on the upper right uh, and the reconstruction of what such houses might have looked like. Um, and we have these, these figurines uh, and picrolite and other materials. Um, which have already also been uh, introduced by Victor, so I'm not going to say too much about them, but these only occur on Cyprus, like the roundhouses, which also don't have a counterpart on the mainland. And then we have also uh, typically Cypriot styles of pottery. So uh, things are quite different on Cyprus. Now the question is, of course, whether uh, the sort of different nature of houses and figurines and pottery is um, an index of isolation, or maybe it's a matter of choice, as one of our colleagues, Diane Bolger, has recently argued. Because actually, if we start to look um, more closely at the data that we have for the Calcolithic, there are indications that uh, the island is not completely isolated in the Calcolithic. Um, we have things like faience beads, which must have been imported. Uh, the faience beads con contain tin, and uh, they probably come from the Levant. We have spurred annular beads, which are very well known from the Aegean and from Turkey, and even from the Baltic. We have uh, Anatolian-style figurines made in picrolite, uh, probably produced on Cyprus. Um, we have pottery that was produced on Cyprus found in Tarsus in the early Bronze Age. And then we also have um, a number of metal artifacts that were supposedly produced from Cypriot copper. So we have um, in Ayapotia, we have a fish hook on uh, Crete and we have an ax from Pella in Jordan and uh, people have been doing um, measurements on, this, uh, on these artifacts with a technique called uh, lead isotope analysis. And they have been arguing that the results of these lead isotope analysis suggest that we might be dealing with artifacts coming from Cyprus. And these uh, objects can be dated in the first half of the third millennium BCE. So contemporary to the calculatic that we've been excavating at Palouris. And so the idea would be that uh, maybe uh, Cyprus is exporting copper and getting other things back in return, so things such as the, um, the faience beads that are on this slide. It's, uh, it's not a lot of evidence, but it's enough to show that these people were not simply isolated, something else was happening. But what was the uh, what was the deal with this, with this metal, with this copper? And can we paint a fuller picture of, uh, of the origins of copper uh, production and export from, uh, from Cyprus? Of course, Cyprus is um, very well known for its copper. It's a, it's a big, um, well, we all know, I suppose, that um, the, uh, the name of copper as a metal and the name of uh, Cyprus as an island are interlinked, kind of like you could use the word Kleenex for a tissue. Um, so uh, there's so much copper on, on Cyprus that at some point these two names have merged. 
here you see the, uh, the place where all the copper uh, is, uh, is, uh, can be found on, on Cyprus in, uh, in purple and an uh, indication of all kinds of uh, ancient slag heaps where uh, in the past copper was mined quite intensively. You see what the copper looks like on the upper right corner, so the green uh, ore. And we know, of course, that from the late Bronze Age onwards, copper was a major export product uh, on Cyprus in the form of oxide ingots that you see in the, in the slide. And uh, for example, in Egypt, they were uh, importing these, as you see on mu murals in uh, grave, uh, graves of the, of the New Kingdom. Um, so the question is, uh, can we push this back and how far can we push this back? And uh, what can we say about this, uh, this issue? Now to um, trace copper uh, back to its sources, um, archeologists, uh, as I indicated before, typically use the technique called lead isotope analysis. And this uses different, um, well, uh, isotopes of lead, which have different atomic weight. Um, and um, to some degree, each ore uh, has, a, has a unique uh, signature. And by plotting different ores, you can uh, try and see where some things might have come from. And you can do the same with objects, of course, that you find in an archaeological context. Of course, this only works if uh, people have not been remelting and mixing metals uh, too often, in which case these kind of signals can get uh, quite confusing. And as you can see on this slide, there's quite a bit of overlap between different ore sources. So it can be difficult to actually, uh, in some cases, to, to be certain from which ore body a particular uh, copper object was actually made. Okay, um, so there are some problems with this sort of this method of visual analysis of copper uh, origins and uh, of, of lead isotope analysis results. Now, with that in mind, let us look at uh, some recent finds from Paluras. So um, I'm zooming in on this uh, trench BU12, which I think Victor was already showing you before. We have a sequence of two buildings, building five and building six, building six being the younger one and actually being built in front of the older building. And while they were doing that, they actually took out some of the wall, uh, wall remains of the earlier building, probably reusing it in this new structure. Um, we also found a bit of um, in situ remains within uh, what looks like building six, but actually some of it belongs with the older building. So this heart over here, we have uh, reconstructed belongs with building five. Um, and then we have this jar, which actually goes with building six. So the younger building in the sequence. Um, and this is a uh, jar that uh, we've already seen just a while ago. So this is what it looked like when we found it. It, it was more or less complete, except for the fact that um, a, a segment of it had been sliced off by plowing. Um, and so the, the, the top of the jar is complete. The belly is partly missing. And again, the bottom is complete. Um, so this was a rather exciting find. And um, this is actually what it looks like after restoration. So a beautiful object has been restored by, uh, by uh, Mariana During and uh, can now be seen in the Paphos Museum. So if you visit the island, you can go on and see it. But the really exciting thing about this uh, jar in a way is what was inside it. Um, so we think that this jar was left as a kind of, um, well, closure deposit. It was a complete jar full uh, and it had a series of objects uh, inside that uh, were these objects. So uh, we have a, all of these objects, this whole collection is rather unique in, uh, in Calcolithic Cyprus. So we have these hooks made of boar tusk, and they were all more or less identical. They're broken, of course, but they would have been of similar size. Um, not clear whether they were used for fishing or for clothing. 
So they might have been used to, um, well, for, for a coat or something like that. They have a little perforation over here. They're really delicately made. And then we have this large stone flat axe. And um, it has been argued that this type of axe was actually not a practical uh, tool. It was difficult to make, but if you would actually start using it, it would break very quickly. And um, Peltenberg, the, the famous uh, uh, scholar working on calculatic ciphers for some decades, has argued that it might have been a skewomorph. So um, an axe, a stone axe, imitating a metal axe. Um, and in, in this case, it was actually found up and lying against this, uh, this metal axe that you see over here. And here is a bit of corrosion of the metal axe still. On the, on the stone axe. Now this, uh, this axe was actually by far the, the largest known metal object in Catholic Cyprus. In all of the, uh, well, the excavations on Cyprus for this period, um, well, there's maybe 10 objects that have been found in total. So it's called the Copper Age, but there's actually very little copper around. And most of the copper objects are very small ornamental type objects that are very um, uh, low in weight. So um, quite small objects. Um, and they, they look a bit like, uh, like these objects here. Um, these are actually also from Palurus. So we have a spiral over here, which might have been uh, a hair ornament. And uh, we have this kind of uh, snake figure uh, that looks a bit like the snake that you saw on the pottery. A shirt that Victor was showing you before. There are similar snake uh, figures from uh, uh, a nearby cemetery of Suskiu, which are better preserved, but this is actually a well-known type in uh, calculated Cyprus. So of course, uh, when we found these objects, we were interested in what type of metal they were produced from and whether we could actually say something about uh, whether they were produced from uh, Cypriot ores or, uh, or maybe not. And so the first thing we did was uh, we used this device that looks a bit like a gun, but it's called a tortable XRF. And you can actually aim it at an object and get a reading up here of the composition of that object. Um, it is a, a technique that's non-destructive, so it's quite popular with archaeologists. Uh, it has its problems, but, um, but it will give you a first indication of what you're dealing with. And so um, we had a remarkable result of, um, of, of uh, using that device. This uh, axe had a tiny amount of, uh, of tin in it. Not enough to call it a bronze by a long shot, but too much to uh, have been produced from uh, or from uh, Cyprus, because the Cypriot copper ores do not have any amount of tin. So we felt that uh, this is probably, this is a weird signal, and uh, it might have been used, produced from, from foreign ores, and we wanted to know more. Um, now, these uh, objects have been restored by the uh, uh, conservators at the Cypriot Museum in Nicosia. And uh, we asked them to keep the, the uh, material that they removed, so the corrosion material, uh, and to, to keep it for us so we could uh, analyze it. And so we, we used that to do a destructive analysis um, using this uh, uh, MC-ICPMS, a multi-collector inductively coupled plasma sp <laughs> mass spectrometry device. I, I had to look that up. Um, it's a huge device, and this is the kind of thing that people use to do lead isotope analysis. Uh, it's destructive and it's more expensive than the portable XRF, but it will get you much better results and um, well, give you a, a reliable indication of what the chemical composition of the metal is. Um, the results of that uh, lead isotope analysis were then um, uh, used to do uh, a new assessment method, which is called uh, kernel density uh, analysis. 
which is a relatively recent development in, in the sort of study of ancient metallurgy. And um, we'll give you a probability evaluation of what uh, force uh, this uh, object might have been made from. And the results were quite uh, remarkable. All these objects that we analyzed from Palura, so both the ax and the smaller spiral and snake, were uh, most likely produced from ores from the Taurus, so from Anatolia. And um, so they were probably imported. The other thing that we also did is reanalyze the uh, data from uh, Ayaputia and Pella, so the lead isotope analysis from those uh, metal artifacts that have been, of course, um, published earlier on, and to see what they were uh, made from. And they were also, in this new analysis, made from Anatolian ore, so not from Cypriot ore. So suddenly, our understanding of, um, of copper production in Copper Age Cyprus starts to shift quite considerably. We do not have any evidence at the moment for the export of Cypriot ores to places like Crete or Jordan. Um, instead, we have all kinds of materials coming into Cyprus especially from the north, so from Anatolia. We have uh, all kinds of, uh, well, we have these figurines that suggest interaction. We have metal objects coming into Cyprus. Uh, we have these, uh, these uh, spurred annular beads or ring idols as they're called elsewhere. We had faience beads coming in. And then we have some material from uh, Cyprus actually in Tarsus, so pottery. But uh, the question, of course, is uh, what's happening here and how can we understand it? Um, in some way, the Cypriots appear to be able to have, have their cake and eat it. So uh, they were not bothering to produce the copper artifacts and to mine through metallurgy. They were just getting it from other places. But of course, it raises the question what they were um, sending in, in return. What was it that uh, induced people from other regions to trade with Cyprus if, if it was not uh, copper? So that calls for additional investigation. So we're only at the start of, um, of this research and to, we, we are a long way from understanding uh, what's actually happening. Um, but um, at, the, at the moment, it seems that copper production uh, starts after the copper age. So that's basically um, the new result from uh, our uh, metal analysis. And I just want to end by uh, thanking a lot of people. So these are the teams from uh, all the excavation seasons. And this is a study season here in the middle. So as Victor already indicated, there's uh, there close to 100 people that were involved in uh, our uh, project so far. And uh, well, if we are able to continue, there will be many uh, more by the time we, we finish. Um, of course, our work uh, is under the permit of the Department of Antiquities of Cyprus, who invited us to, to come over. And um, we have uh, been funded by, among others, the Bifunk Fund um, and uh, Nino and the LUF. Um, and we also had. Uh, a good amount of sponsorship by Ian Cohn and Vicky Cohn. So we're very grateful for that. And um, yeah, and we had uh, help from Edgar Feltenberg and Diane Bolger. And so I'm very help, uh, grateful to all these uh, people for, for making our work possible. And of course, um, the Friends of Palurus who organized this evening and are supporting the project. So I think that's basically the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening.